In the 21st century, those who change the world are those who change the culture. They get people in sync, lead tribes, create movements, and generate an energy field where ordinary people achieve extraordinary results. I woke up one morning um, to my husband shouting that he was going to kill us all. Um, and the thing is, he'd, he'd threatened to kill me before. Um, and for some reason, I hadn't really taken it seriously. I don't know why. Uh, but when he, when as soon as he threatened the children, I was like, that's it, I'm off. Um, so, I, yeah, I packed a bag, um, packed a suitcase, mainly with nappies and, like, kids' clothes, and got the uh, the two boys into the double buggy and my little daughter um, and ran over to my friend's house and phoned up Women's Aid, you know, so that we could hopefully get a place in a women's refuge. I'm Aga Bayer, and this is the Culture Lab podcast, where you will find ideas and inspiration on how to harness the power of team and organizational culture. I talk to leadership thinkers, culture experts, entrepreneurs, and all sorts of movers and shakers, and together we explore the fascinating topic of culture, leadership, and personal growth. If you like what you're hearing, subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Better yet, write a review on iTunes and share the podcast with your followers on social media. For more, check out our archive at agabayer.com slash podcast. Hello, and welcome to episode 23. Before I dive into this episode, I just wanted to share a little bit of background because people always ask me why I'm doing a podcast on culture and also why I'm so obsessed with culture. So here is why. Culture is probably the only thing that impacts everything that happens in our teams, organizations, and society to such a huge extent. We all know that with the right culture, the sky is literally the limit. And with the wrong culture, everything seems difficult and nothing ever gets done. Actually, I think that when culture works against us, it feels like gravity only 10 times stronger. And so I find very often in organizations is that people feel completely unable to move towards their goals because they are just pinned to the ground by this gravitational pull of culture. And that kind of sucks because, you know, at the end of the day, I really believe that we all deserve to go home after work feeling fulfilled, energized and accomplished. And we all deserve a chance to contribute to something much bigger than us and something that we can be proud of. And with the right culture, this becomes possible. And I was recently reminded again of David Foster Wallace and his famous commencement speech where the key message basically was that culture is to people what water is to fish, something that's invisible in plain sight. So you have something that's all-encompassing and at the same time invisible. And I think that this makes culture such a powerful force but also what makes it so difficult to get a handle on and do something about. And so I realized that we needed more conversations that can help us get a handle on culture and bring about change that we need. And every second week, I'm joined by amazing guests and my team and I produce this podcast for listeners just like you who are interested in the topic of culture and leadership and who are looking for something useful, some tips and inspiration on how to shape culture in their company, their team and their community. And I'm so grateful for you tuning in and for the listeners who review Culture Lab on iTunes and elsewhere and give it a five-star rating. It's so wonderful to know that you are listening and even more so knowing that you find the podcast interesting and useful. Here is a couple of reviews from the US this time. The first one is from E.S. Barnes and he or she says, Brilliant. With decades of research and experience, these guests are above all optimistic 
and offer practical tools to take into the workplace and implement change. We could all benefit from being kinder to one another, regardless of where we stand within the hierarchy of the company. Looking forward to hearing more. Thank you, Iaz Barnes, for the lovely review. So glad to hear from you. And so Joe Kipper says... First of all, he says, or she says, culture is king, and then continues and says, I love the content of this podcast and the variety of guests Aga has on regularly. She is smart, engaging, and kind. Ah, oh, thank you, Sojo Kipper. So if you like the podcast but haven't rated or reviewed it yet, please take a few minutes and rate it on iTunes because it really helps the podcast to be discovered by other people like you who care about culture, want to challenge the status quo and are looking for ideas, tips and inspiration on how to do that. Also, if you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe to my newsletter, The Culture Lab Insider. To subscribe, you just go to my website, agabayer.com slash podcast, and you scroll down to the bottom of the page. And now let me introduce my today's guest, Dr. Sue Black. Sue is a technology evangelist and digital skills expert, and she was awarded an OBE for services to technology by the Queen. She's a UK government advisor, thought leader, honorary professor, a social entrepreneur, writer, and a public speaker. Her current social enterprise, Tech Moms, is changing lives and changing culture. Tech Moms teaches moms tech skills and builds their confidence and encourages them into education, entrepreneurship, and employment. Sue has a really incredible personal story and shares it in such a wonderful and engaging way that I'm completely convinced that you love this episode. Um, plus, there's a lot of learning about how to overcome our fears and lead a movement for culture change in this episode. Have a listen. So welcome to Culture Lab. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. We are delighted and thrilled to have you. Thank you for making the time to come on the podcast. No, you're very welcome. I'm very excited. I'm very excited too, and <laughs> I'm really excited to, to find out uh, what were your early cultural influences? How did you grow up and how did that shape you as a person? Well, I suppose when I was younger, I was extremely shy to start with. Um, so, you know, I was a very shy uh, five-year-old, ten-year-old. In fact, until probably my thirties, when I started really uh, blossoming, I think. Um, so I grew up with the mum, dad, brother, and sister. My brother and sister are twins, and they're five years younger than me. And grew up in various places around the southeast of England. My parents were both nurses, and about every three years, my dad would get a new job, and we'd move to a new area. So we didn't stay in any place for more than about three years. Um, and yeah, I was just like a regular average family. What happened, unfortunately, when I was 12 was that my mum died and uh, my basically my whole environment went from being sort of a, you know, a loving home to a bit more of a kind of dysfunctional family. Um, my dad remarried quite quickly and yeah, I just basically wasn't happy. So from about the age of about 13 uh, to 16, I felt like I was living in a hostile environment, I think, really. And um, so, you know, I was going to school and coming home, but really not happy and um, sort of being emotionally bullied, I suppose. And I spent a lot of time sitting in my bedroom thinking about how unfair the world was and how unfair my life was um, and kind of wanting to uh, escape really. And um, when I was 16, I did escape. So as soon as I could leave home, I did really and uh, went to live with my friend's family. And yeah, my, my kind of my, I guess my adult life really started then when I managed to leave home and... At 16. Yeah, at 16 and, and just kind of be wow. more of a... Um, more in control of what was happening to me. So what did you do at 16? So you move into your friend's house. Yeah. Well, so I was at school still. So I was doing uh, my A-levels. So that's like from 16 to 18, you do A-levels in the UK. Uh, I started doing that. My I went to a school which was 25 miles away. So I had to get up early to go to school, get back late. And because I was living in my friend's house, my friend's family weren't wealthy. So I needed to pay them for my food and stuff. So... 
I would go to work in the evenings in a local cafe. So I worked as a waitress in a local cafe in the evenings and at the weekend to pay my rent, um, which was, was great to start with. But eventually what happened was that I was getting too tired. I wasn't um, doing well at school. I was going to school and then falling asleep. Um, so I decided after a few months of doing that to, to leave school because I just thought I'm not going to pass any exams. Um, you know, it's just too much. I was getting up early in the morning, going to school, being at school all day, coming home, going straight to the cafe, working in the cafe till late in the evening, then coming back. And, and also part of my, uh, kind of like in lieu of rent payment where I was living with my friend's family was to do all the washing up. So it's pre dishwasher days (laughs) was to do all the washing up. Um, for for the family and the lodgers, which probably I think was about 10 people. So I'd do all the washing up for everybody, all the drying up. Um, and I'd probably get to bed between 12 and 1 in the morning and then, you know, get up again at sort of 6.30. And, and, and just basically, I couldn't do it. So, um, yeah, after a few months, I realised that I wasn't going to get any qualifications. So I left and got a job working for the local council. And so you leave school at 16. As you say, you were really shy and then uh, at some point, and it was 30 years ago, yeah. you said you, you were already married and yeah. you had three small children. Yeah. And one day you woke up to something that changed your life forever. What happened yeah. that morning? Yeah. Yeah. So, well, so, um, you know, I, I was working for the local council at 16, 17 and I hated it. So I decided I wanted to move to London. So I moved to London, worked in various roles, one with um, refugees from Vietnam. And then at 20, I got married, had my daughter, my first daughter quite quickly. And then uh, decided that I was going to have another baby and then go back to work. But that baby turned out to be twins. So at 23, I had a two-year-old and, and twin boys. And you know, I just couldn't have gone back to work then. Uh, but then unfortunately after that, my marriage broke down. So yeah, at 25, I think I was, I woke up one morning um, to my husband shouting that he was going to kill us all. Um, and the thing is, he'd, he'd threatened to kill me before. Um, and for some reason, I hadn't really taken it seriously. I don't know why. Uh, but when he, when he, as soon as he threatened the children, I was like, that's it, I'm off. Um, so I, yeah, I packed a bag. Um, packed a suitcase mainly with nappies and like kids clothes and got the uh, the two boys into the double buggy and my little daughter um, and ran over to my friend's house and phoned up women's aid you know so that we could hopefully get a place in a women's refuge and uh, managed to get get one and uh, I think we arrived in the refuge late late afternoon that day you know I'm Ah, uh, I'm just, I have no words. I can't even imagine how you felt uh, when, as you were walking with the buggy with your twins and a new young daughter, your three-year-old daughter, uh, and you didn't know where you were going to go. Do you yeah. still remember what was going on in your mind as you were walking away yeah. from your home? Yeah, I mean, to start with, I just wanted to get away because I didn't want to die. Uh, yeah. And I didn't <laughs> want my, my, you know, to try and get my kids away from the threat, I suppose, uh, was my thought thought to start with so I just you know like ran ran over to my friend's house over the road um we phoned up women's aid and um they said uh, we'll ring you back when we've got you a place so I'm just sitting there waiting the phone rang again and I picked it up and it was my ex-husband saying he's going to kill us again so so I actually had to leave that friend's house get the kids back in you know get the boys back in the buggy and run down to my other friend Karen's place down the road which is I don't know like quarter of a mile or something um and go into her um, into her house and then tell her what was happening and rang back women's aid and they said oh we've been trying to get in touch with you um, but they had a place for me the other side of London so I didn't have any money my ex-husband wouldn't give me any money at all um, so um, we got in the uh, so my friend called a cab we got in a cab over to the uh, to the uh, sort of refuge uh, like admin like office place uh, to sort of be interviewed basically about what happened and for them to work out what to do with us. Um, yeah, right the other side of London. And I think, yeah, we arrived there, I don't know, maybe lunchtime. I think we were there. They were interviewing us all day um, and working out where to place us. And then I think we eventually got a room in a house. Um, but yeah, so mainly scared, <laughs> not yeah. knowing what to do, but kind of I was completely just taken over with finding a safe space, just find a safe space for me and my children. 
Yeah. So when when that goal was accomplished, when you yeah. had the safe space, yeah. what were your next thoughts? What plans did you have at that moment in your life? I think to start with, I didn't really know, you know, because I, I suppose it's not like, I mean, I sort of knew that something like that might be on the cards, but I didn't think it would get that bad, to be honest. So it's not like I'd made some major plans of what I was going to do with the rest of my life, really, in those circumstances. But I mean, I remember waking up the next morning and thinking, okay, they'd give me something like £10 to go and get some food in the morning because um, I didn't have any money at all. So I, I remember getting up in the morning, finding out where the local supermarket was and going and finding some food for breakfast. Um, um, and, you know, like walking down the road, find, finding this uh, supermarket, buying some basic provisions and kind of on, on the way back to the refuge, probably about, I don't know, half nine in the morning or something. I just remember walking up the road and suddenly I just thought I'm going to be sick. <laughs> so actually I ended up um, like, you know, just being sick in the gutter. Um, and then somehow that felt like like after that happened, I just felt like some of the anxiety just went with it somehow. And, and I started thinking, okay, I think it's going to be all right. You know, I think, you know, we've got somewhere to stay. I've now got some food, you know, I need to kind of start thinking, what am I going to do now? You know, so the kind of the worry disappeared, I think. And, um, I started thinking, yeah, so so what am I going to do now? But in a, a more positive way, rather than just uh, sort of running away scared, that kind of started to disappear. And um, I started to think in a more positive way, okay, things are going to be okay. We have got a stable place, you know, it, it is all going to be okay. So was that the moment when you decided that you were going to actually take your life in your own hands and change it for the better or was was it more of a gradual I think process? it was more of a gradual thing I think it was more gradual so you know to start with I knew that we couldn't stay in the refuge forever um, and actually unfortunately what happened was that after about a week in the refuge maybe two weeks I can't remember exactly um uh, the first friend that I'd gone to her house um to ring up women's aid she uh, gave the number of the refuge to my ex-husband. So he phoned up the refuge. And unfortunately, there was about, I think about eight families in there. Unfortunately, I was passing the phone um, when he called and picked it up. So then I had an hour of him telling me how he was going to kill me and kill the children. And he didn't care if he went to prison for the rest of his life, we were all going to be dead. Um, so after I, you know, kind of really calmed down, I suppose, after the, I think it was about two weeks later, um, I had that phone call. And so when I told the refuge staff, they said, okay, we need to move you to another refuge because we're not sure that you're safe here. So then after two weeks, we had to move to a different refuge um, where there, there was no phone. So basically no, no phone calls. It's pre-mobile phone days. And um, yeah, they said, don't contact anyone that you know, no one. So I didn't contact any friends, just nobody for, for months. So, you know, in a way that, that helped me to know that we were safe. But in another way, it meant that I had no support network or anybody outside of the refuge. Um, so, you know, so that, that was really difficult. We were really isolated. But again, still, I was happier in that situation than I was living at home. So how did you decide in those days to go back to school? Well, so after, I think after three months in the refuge, uh, we were seen as a family that was, you know, able to look after themselves. And I w uh, contacted the, the council. So we had a council flat um, where we lived in West London and I was able, and so by then my ex-husband had, had left the council flat uh, and basically kind of given it up. So it was an empty property. So I was able to swap swap that flat for a flat near where the refuge was in South London. Um, so I was sort of negotiating getting that sorted and also, yeah, just kind of trying to work out what to do with the rest of my life uh, in this new uh, scenario. And um, we eventually, so we were in the refuge for like six months and then, yeah, and then so then I got the flat, the flat exchange went through and um, I went to view a flat in uh, Brixton, which is where we uh, ended up in South London and and liked it and uh, moved in basically, uh, yeah, six months after we first went into the refuge. And then so once I had a stable place to live, you know, we had our own flat, that was amazing. And then I thought, okay, well, so by then my daughter was four and my sons were two. I was thinking I need to try and get my daughter into school. 
So, uh, you know, contacted all the schools in the area to try and find a place for her, got a place for her. My sons were two, found a playgroup place for them, so like two hours a day childcare um, for them nearby. So I, I got all of them sorted. And uh, then I thought, okay, well, so everyone else is sorted. What am I going to do? And um, I thought about going back to work, you know, because I'd worked for four years from 16 to 20 before I had my daughter. And I thought about going back into work. Uh, but, you know, I'd left school with sort of minimal qualifications, so I didn't have a degree or anything. Um, so looking at how much I would have earned going back into the workplace, it wouldn't have been that much and it wouldn't have covered childcare, you know, like to pay for the kids to be looked after outside of the, the provision that I'd already found. I, I wouldn't have earned enough money for that for three children. So I knew that going back to work basically wasn't an option because I, I just wouldn't earn enough money. So then I started thinking about, well, so how could I earn more money eventually? Well, education, you know, like if I can get a degree, if I can go back into education, if I get a degree, I'll be able to earn money, more money when I'm back in the workplace. Uh, and so, you know, that, that's basically what I did. I thought, well, what was my favorite subject at school? And it was always maths. I always loved maths. Was it? So, yeah. <laughs> so, so I thought, um, I thought, uh, why don't I see if I can do like a maths course at the local college and see if that will get me university, you know, get me into university. So, went along to the local college, met this great teacher, Willie Taylor, who um, chatted to me about my situation and what courses were available. And luckily there was a course which ran two evenings a week from 6 to 9 p.m. And the, the idea with it was that you would study at home for 20 hours a week. So they gave you loads of stuff to read each week. And the time so that would kind of be the uh, the theoretical part of the uh, class and actually what you did in the classroom was that the teacher would give a quick overview and answer any questions of the material that you'd been reading at home and then you'd be in groups working through problems with uh, you know assisted by the teachers in the classroom for the rest of the time and actually that was the perfect class for me to do because a it was um kind of a fast track course so it got me the equivalent of two a levels which is what you need to get into university uh in one year uh, with just six hours a week contact time so that worked well i just needed to get a babysitter two evenings a week and read all of the uh sort of theoretical stuff during the week when the kids were at school and at playgroup so that fit really well for me and um when I, I remember walking into the first class I was just so scared um because you know I hadn't been in a classroom since I was 16 and now I was 26 and you know in a very different place and kind of a different person in a way being a single parent with three kids and um I walked into the classroom and saw lots of guys in suits and I just thought oh my god what have I done <laughs> So, so scared. And then I saw a friendly looking woman at the back of the class. So I just went to the back of the class and sat next to her and said hi. And um, we were both, I think we were both a bit kind of scared. <laughs> <laughs> and did she turn out to be nice? Yeah, yeah, well. yeah. She was great. So she turned out to be a great friend. And also at the end of the year, we came joint top of the class. So it was quite funny that, that all, all the sort of parts of maths that I was good at, she was weaker at, and all the bits that she was good at, I was weaker at. So we managed to help each other with the, you know, the bits that we weren't so good at. And um, yeah, that, that was wonderful, really. Um, that was my friend Lorna. Mm. She was great and, and made a a big difference and uh, yeah so then you know did well on the course and that gave us uh, the ability to to go to university so then went to um, South Bank Uni which was down the road from where I lived and studied computing for for four years I did a, a placement during that where I worked with uh, Haringey Council in North London helping to put computers into schools so got a lot of experience talking to school secretaries who a lot of whom didn't want a computer and mm. um Weren't, weren't that keen on technology. So I think that kind of informed my thinking maybe later on with some of the things that I've done. And um, yeah, so I did a degree. And then in the last year of my degree, my um, second supervisor for my project during one of our meetings said to me, oh, what do you think about doing a PhD? So I said, oh, I'd love to do a PhD. Wow. But what I didn't tell him was I didn't know what a PhD was. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, d I didn't actually know what a PhD was so I um 
yeah, I told him that I'd love to do it, but I didn't actually know. So I went to the library after the meeting and found out what a PhD was. And they thought, oh, yeah, actually, I would like to do a PhD. So um, when I finished my degree, what I had thought was that I would get get a job at the end of my degree, but then kind of realized again that my children were still quite small. You know, it's only four years later. They were like um, eight and six, I think. So, mm-hmm. you know, still quite small to leave them being a single parent um, mm-hmm. or, you know, like uh, without me around. So mm-hmm. decided that actually rather than going out and getting a full-time job, well, I did get a full-time job, which was a PhD um, with teaching, but um, PhDs like university employment is much more flexible um, mm-hmm. than traditionals, you know, like working for a consultancy or something yes. would be very different. So I actually applied to be a maths teacher and applied to do a PhD and got both and decided that the PhD was, was the best way forward. Fabulous. Uh-huh. So when, <laughs> exactly. That's what an amazing story. And I think that there is a theme there that you sort of did things in spite of your fear because you mentioned being terrified yeah. many times. And yeah. in spite of that, you just kept plodding and yeah. basically doing it. So do you have anything to say to our listeners who sometimes might feel like, oh, my God, I don't know how I'm going to do it? What's, what's the way to overcome it? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, you know, because I, I get asked this sort of thing, like, you know, what was it in you that, that made you do that? And and the basic answer is I don't know. But um, but kind of the thought process in, in my head, I think, really. And I, I think maybe because I'd had such an awful time at home for three years being unable to escape out of that situation from age 13 to 16. And then, you know, and then I'd kind of had to escape from having my life threatened. I think something in my head was saying to me, what's the worst thing that can happen? You know, because you've already gone through all of that. You know, it can't be that bad. So I don't think I was consciously telling myself that, but I think that was part of my sort of decision making, probably in the back of my mind, to be able to push themselves forward. So, but I do think kind of thinking, what is, yeah, what is the worst thing that can happen? I think is, is a good thing to think about. Yeah. Totally. Because I think we get scared of things which, in fact, shouldn't be that scary. It's just we've either been, you know, I think I think as as girls and women, we're brought up to to make sure that everyone else is OK before we are. So, like, kind of put yourself last is is how to be a good girl. Right. Um, which it doesn't doesn't help when you're trying to achieve and, and push yourself forward. Although I think t- to a certain extent, it sounds like um, wanting to take care of your kids was a driving force for you as well, yeah, because true. you started thinking, okay, what, what do I have to do to be able to take care of them? Going back to work is probably not a good idea. So actually you started thinking, how can I provide for my family yeah. in a way that is sustainable and that will really uh, create a better life for us? Yeah, true. Um, so may- maybe there's something there as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. But, and, and I think that, you know, like guys are brought up to be competitive in general. And I think as as girls or women we're not so much but but that doesn't mean that it's wrong you know I think that we have to try and work out because I think we like everyone has things that hold them back in some way so I think trying to become aware of what it is specifically it's holding you back as a person because we've all got something um and working out what to do about it I think that kind of like analyzing myself and my behavior I think has helped me over the years and and looking at patterns of my behavior um, has helped me to kind of make things better in my life too. You know, I mean, I I feel like it's funny because I kind of get held up as as an example of someone that has gone forward and done what they want to do. But I've spent ridiculous amounts of time worrying about things, far too much time worrying about, is this the right thing or not? Is it the right thing or not? Um, just over and over again. And, and, you know, am I doing the right thing for my children? Am I doing the right thing for my career? I, I, I don't worry about it so much. I still worry quite a lot as a person anyway. So it's quite weird because I'm a very chilled out person who worries a lot. So it doesn't really make sense, but that just seems to be who I am. And I kind of can see from looking back that it's good. Once I've made a decision, I just get on with it. So that bit of my personality I like and that I just do that. But quite often when I don't quite know what to do, I can spend even years worrying about what to do about something without taking any action. And I feel like, that's something that I still need to work on myself. Yeah. So I'm, if I can see, you know, like, so 
you know, kind of like moving on to what I'm doing at the moment. So running Tech Mums, this organisation, I could see a clear problem. Like people in general are kind of a bit scared of technology, think they can't do it. Um, but for me, that's holding us back as a country, you know, a, a, and you know, that holds people back as individuals and organisations back because technology offers so many opportunities to do so many different things now. If you're scared of it, that's all of those opportunities disappear, right? You haven't got them. And so if you, um, so I, I kind of saw a problem that I feel I want to do something about this to try and get more people to understand the benefits of technology in all sorts of ways. And so started running workshops with kids thinking, so do I want to get kids into technology? Is that the way to solve it? And then seeing um, mums coming into the kids' workshops, feeling very hesitant about having go, having a go at the technology themselves. Then seeing, okay, thinking I can solve this problem. Then I can solve this problem by teaching mums tech skills, getting them more excited about technology. And that's the way that I'm going to try and solve this problem. So when I've seen those things, I've just done something about it. But but where I get stuck is where when I don't quite know what to do. And I can't think of a specific example in my life, but it's happened over and over again, that I don't quite know what to do in a certain situation. And instead of just saying, okay, well, I'm going to do this, what I tend to do is just prevaricate forever. Like I just, uh -huh. it's like it's on hold in my head. Yeah. It just goes round yeah, and round yeah. and round and round and I don't make a decision. Mm. So, you know, there are some things where I just go for it, where I can see that I think this is the solution. But where, when I don't know the solution, I, I just tend to leave it. And sometimes that just messes things up because sometimes you've just got mm -hmm. to make that decision and get on with it. And I don't. So mm -hmm. I feel like this is a counselling session for me now. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. <laughs> so I have two questions about this. The first one is, uh, so you mentioned tech mums and you mentioned how you noticed that um, so people feel uncomfortable around technology and particularly women. Um, so how, and I know that now you have done quite a lot of work around this and actually you have this ambitious goal of helping 1 million women uh, to be more technology savvy. Um, so I'm curious, what are you noticing about our current culture as a society in relation to women in technology? Well, yes, yeah, so it's been really interesting, actually, over the last few years. So 20 years ago, so, you know, so I did, did a degree, did a PhD um, and from going to conferences as a PhD student, um, like academic computer science conferences, there weren't very many women there. And my supervisor had told me that you need to network at conferences. So so basically, I was forcing myself because I was so shy uh, to go and chat to men at conferences mainly because there weren't many women. Um, and I had some some great chats, but also some quite um, scary uh, situations where I think basically looking back, the guys thought I was trying to chat them up, whereas I just wanted to talk about my research. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of that was quite uncomfortable and it didn't feel great. And then I went to a women in science conference in Brussels in um, 1998. And that kind of changed my life in a way because it was an all just about all female environment. And I hadn't thought about that at all, like really going there. And then Normally, when I went to conferences, I felt very sort of isolated. Um, but going to this conference, I so kind of as soon as I walked in, someone was chatting to me. And then, I don't know, I walked over to get a cup of tea and everyone was chatting to each other. And, I, and it just really helped me to realise that if you're in the majority, life is very different. So as a small minority going to a normal academic computer science conference, none of the guys would be coming up to chat to me. Like They're all chatting to each other in kind of a general way just as you do nothing wrong with it um but they probably weren't coming over to me as a woman because they you know, i might think they were trying to chat me I, I just don't know right but it's just there's just some kind of barrier there um and i find that actually from going to other conferences which are more of a 50 50 men and women that doesn't happen so it just seems to be like with a majority big majority small minority kind of uh, situations uh and so yeah it really changed my life going to this conference in brussels because i just thought oh my goodness, there's all these women that love tech as well as me. And um, it's not that I'm useless at conferences and speaking to people. It's just that being in a minority is hard and or harder. And if I'm in a majority audience, I don't need to really make an effort. It just almost seems to spontaneously happen. So I thought, why don't I try and create this situation 
for women in tech in the UK? Why don't I create an online network? Because we don't meet each other in person so much. So that we can all chat about tech stuff that we care about online. So then I, so I set up this group in 1998. So it was 20 years ago. And um, one of the... Um, people that I was talking to about what I was doing said to me, why are you ghettoizing yourself? And I was like, what? What is he talking about? Like, I couldn't really understand for some time what he really meant. But yeah, so he thought I was creating a ghetto. So I thought I was doing this amazing, exciting thing, connecting all these women together so we could have somewhere to chat to each other, which we didn't really find in everyday life. And he saw it as a ghetto. So so that just amazed me, really. Um, and I think... It's crazy, isn't Yeah, it? yeah, absolutely crazy. And, um, you know, the, the stats then for women in tech were about sort of 15, 20%. And, you know, so I often get asked these days, so, you know, so what's changed then? Um, because the stats that's still 15 or 20 percent women in tech um and uh you know i mean there there is there's a massive difference now i i would say that the whole women in stem it's sort of women's empowerment has come on leaps and bounds in the last few years i think because of because basically because of technology because of the internet connecting us all together and because of social media enabling us just through a hashtag for example to be able to find hundreds thousands millions of other people who care about the same things that we do so from like me too black lives matter so so groups of people that couldn't find each other before can now find find each other and of course that's going to create change it's going to create social change and so in terms of the the women in tech area it's massively different to how it was 20 years ago you know setting up this group you know was like a, a novel 20 years ago was it like a novel and for me exciting but for some people kind of radical thing to do um whereas there's hundreds of women in tech groups probably just in london now and you know it it's seen as a as a normal thing that women would want to to meet up and talk about technology with each other whereas 20 years ago that wasn't seen as a normal thing and you know now companies are realizing the potential of of having more diversity uh, in their workforce more women and you know really uh, putting starting to put money uh, behind that uh, initiatives within companies to get more women uh, working more women in tech, you know, they're everywhere you go, there seems to be women in tech stuff or women in STEM stuff now, or girls in tech, girls in STEM, which is amazing. And, um, you know, and people then say to me, yeah, but the stats haven't changed. And I, but I just think yet they haven't changed yet, but they're going to change because there's been a whole, you know, a, a real big change in the way that people see this as as an issue and realize that they need to do something to, to sort it out and so there's all these initiatives now and of course it's going to take time to change the stats you know it might be five or ten years before we see a massive change um but the change is coming now i feel i can kind of feel it feel it in the air yes yeah, I agree. And I think it's a very interesting point that you are raising about how minorities now have this opportunity to connect and through social media and how important it is, because I really do find that that plays a major role in any sort of culture change and even historically. So people didn't have that opportunity in the past, but the only way culture has ever been changed in the history of mankind was when you know, one person had an idea and they started to talk to people about this and then they created a small group of like-minded people and that that group started growing and growing. And yeah. I think that through social media today, those groups or those tribes, sometimes as people call them, they can grow faster. And I think it's absolutely amazing that a girl in Nigeria or a girl in the Philippines can reach out um, to her colleagues or to other girls interesting in, interested in tech for example, in, in the UK yeah. and exchange experiences yeah. and support each other. And we didn't have that when we were younger. So it's amazing that, that women yeah. and men and people generally have this opportunity today. So I have a question that is linked to social media, but before we go there, I, I want you to help us understand, and especially I think for the listeners overseas, um, what is Bletchley Park and how you were involved in with that. So when you were a PhD student, you first visited Bletchley Park, which was that top secret home of the Second World War code breakers. And yeah. it was around 2003, uh, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, the first time I went was 2003, yeah. yeah. And so you were surprised by something when you visited Bletchley Park. What was the biggest surprise for you? 
<laughs> yeah. So yeah. So so after setting up, so BCS Women is the is the women's network that I set up in 1998, uh, and because I was leading that organisation, I got invited up to a meeting at Bletchley Park um, in 2003, and. I didn't really know anything much about Bletchley Park. So what I knew about Bletchley Park was that the code breakers worked there so during the Second World War. Uh, and that's probably about it. I, for some reason, in my head, I had I had this vision of kind of like 50 old blokes um, sitting around code breaking. And um, that's kind of like all I knew about it, really, or thought I knew. Uh, and then went to a meeting there. And after the meeting, went for a walk around the site. It's a massive site. So it's um, it used to be 52 acres, I think, um, in the Second World War. And half of it had been sold off for housing development. development. So in 2003, it was still 26 acres. So a really large site uh, with like a big mansion house and uh, lots of uh, huts kind of all around it. Um, a big lake and uh, sort of like grassy areas, lots of trees. Yeah, and all these kind of code-breaking huts. And um, so, again, I didn't really know much about what happened there or anything. Um, so, I just thought, well, I'm going to walk around and find out more about this place after the meeting. So, I, I walked into one of the huts that was there and saw these guys who were sort of tinkering away on this sort of big kind of feat of engineering. I didn't know what it was at all, but it looked very interesting to me. So I went over to start talking to them um, and, you know, said, what are you doing, basically? So they they told me that they were rebuilding one of the machines that was used to industrialise the code-breaking process. So, you know, they'd started off code-breaking using pencil and paper, but they wanted to be able to kind of crank through lots of... Um, uh, combinations to work out to kind of break the codes basically and so these machines allowed them to do that and they told me that all of the machines that were used to do that were um, all, all um, broken up at the end of the second world war and all the parts were buried um, so so that no one would ever find out what exactly they'd done there so I thought well that that sounds all very exciting um so I was chatting to them about that and then they asked me why I was there and um oh I said I'm here for this uh, uh this meeting representing this group of women in computing uh, so they said oh did you know that more than half the people that worked here were women so I was like no I didn't know that because I kind of had this 50 <laughs> old men in my uh, head and um yeah. Uh, I said, how many people worked here? So they said more than 10,000. So I was like, wow, wow. more than 10,000 people worked here. So that means more than 5,000 women worked here. Why didn't I know that women worked here? Why, why was that not part of what I knew? Because with my interest in this area, if that was widely known, I would have known about it. So, you know, so that information wasn't really out there. So, so that time, that was about all I knew, really, that code breaking happened there, that it was kind of industrialized and that more than 5,000 women worked there. And I just really wanted to try and tell the women's story, I guess, get, get those stories out there. So that time when I left in 2003... I went away and um, raised some money to run an oral history project. So to record the memories of some of the women that worked there so that they wouldn't be lost. Because, of course, the, the people that worked there were getting older, mainly in their 80s then, I think. And, um, you know, I really wanted to capture their memories. So so that happened. We recorded the memories of the women at the launch of that project, which was in 2007, I think. Um, I, I, I sort of spoke about why I thought it was important to capture the women's memories, what we'd done on the project. And then um, the guy who was director of Bletchley Park at the time, Simon Greenish, gave a talk in which he said that that they were, Bletchley Park was teetering on a financial knife edge. It was mainly run by volunteers. He was really worried that uh, the site may have to shut down. So it was run as a museum, but they were really, really struggling uh, with funding. And most of the, the money that came in was from people visiting, so from people paying to go and visit the site. Um, and, they, you know, their numbers weren't going up, and he was worried that if – um, anything happened. So at the time, there was uh, talk of a swine flu epidemic. And he was worried if there was a swine flu epidemic, numbers would drop visiting. So their income would drop, so they'd have to close. Um, and he said, if we close, we won't ever be able to open again. It's not just not the sort of thing that you could get up and running again. So I just thought, oh, that's terrible. <laughs> so I talked to him about it and um, at the launch in London and then was invited up to a reception at Bletchley Park um, I think a couple of months later and 
so this time was the first time that I did a full tour of the site, which I'd not done before. I learned so much more about the history of Bletchley Park and its contribution in the Second World War. And I kind of had this poignant moment where I was standing looking at one of these code-breaking huts, which looked like it was falling down with like a tarpaulin over the roof to stop the rain getting in. And um, the, the guy that had taken us on the tour was one of the veterans that had worked at Bletchley Park during the Second World War. Uh, and as part of, you know, he was telling us about the major code-breaking achievements that saved thousands of lives in just in the hut that we were looking at. Uh, and he said that um, the work that was done at Bletchley Park was said to have shortened World War II by two years. And at that time, 11 million people a year were dying. So potentially the work that was done there had, had saved 22 million lives. And I just kind of stood there practically crying, thinking, I've got to do something about this. I must do something about it. Um, and so really that was the beginning of me starting a campaign to, to save Bletchley Park. Yeah. And so for, for those people who haven't read your book, um, Saving Bletchley Park, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you should definitely read it, guys, Thank if you, you haven't read it. Thank you, good for the book. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what would you say are the elements of a successful social media campaign based on this experience? Because I, I don't think that you really knew what you were doing at the very beginning, but it was definitely a learning journey. So what did you learn through that? Absolutely. Also, yeah, so I hadn't you really used social media at that point, um, I don't think. So my first thought was to contact my peer group and get see if I could get them on board. So by then I'd, I'd um, finished my PhD, then I became a lecturer senior lecturer, then a principal lecturer, and by then I was head of department. So I was head of department of a computer science department at the University of Westminster. So I was in a network of all the heads and professors of computing in the country. So I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll email all of them and ask them to sign this petition, which someone had set up on the um, the Prime Minister's website in the UK, uh, which someone else had set up asking the government to, to save Bletchley Park. So I sent an email around to, to my peer group, to all the heads and professors of computing in the UK with, with a photo of, of the hut with the blue tarpaulin over it, saying, we've got to do something about this. Please sign this petition. And then I checked it after I sent that email. Quite a few people responded saying, oh, you know, this is great. Thank you, know, thank you for first sort of making us aware and uh, can we do anything else kind of emails and also I looked on the uh, Prime Minister's petition website a few hours later and noticed that all of these famous professors of computer science from around the UK were signing the petition I was like oh my goodness you know like these are the people that I I use their textbooks as a student like these people that I've never met are signing this petition I found that amazing and it gave me a lot of confidence to kind of do something else, really, and all the support that I got. So I chatted to my colleague uh, at work and said, what, what else can we do? And he said, why don't we write a letter to the Times? So he drafted a letter, John drafted a letter, and then we sent that round to everybody. So we wrote a letter to the Times newspaper, uh, like sort of like an open letter saying we need to save Bletchley Park, asking government or technology companies uh, to come on board and help save Bletchley Park. So... Uh, we sent that around and, and within uh, a couple of days, we had about 100 signatures. And then I thought, well, why don't I try and make a bigger splash? So why don't I contact all the journalists that I know? I didn't really know any, um, but I had the contact details for, I think, about four. So I, I emailed them. I said, I think this is a story. And uh, in a nutshell, the longer story is in the book, but in a nutshell, um, Rory Keflin jones who's the BBC technology correspondent, came back saying, yes, OK, I think this is a story. Um, so he interviewed me at Bletchley Park uh, saying that I'm ashamed to be British. Why aren't we looking after our heritage? Uh, and that went out on BBC News kind of across the UK in July 2008, I think, and uh, also Radio 4 Today programme, which is like the news programme uh, that loads of people listen to in the morning um, yeah, on Radio 4. And uh, so that kind of went out there and it ended up on BBC America, I think, and uh, kind of across the world, really. So I got friends from around the world saying, I just saw you on TV. <laughs> so, that, so that was quite funny. And I just probably had about 200 emails that day. So, so, so that was kind of like the for me, the traditional media approach, that's kind of all I could think of to do really was to get to traditional media. So from deciding that to it happening, it took about two weeks. It didn't take very long, amazingly, I think. Um, 
But then, you know, like two weeks after that, I was like, well, so what do I do now then? Because I didn't know what else to do. And so I carried on kind of talking to people that I met about it. You know, I was going to lots of technology events and stuff in those days. So talking to lots of people about it, everyone that I met probably got bored of me saying, blah, 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 Bletchley Park. Um, and then towards the end of that year, so yeah, towards the end of, I think, 2008, I... Um, was at a conference and the guy on stage, a guy called Watley Dude, said, who's here? Who here is on Twitter? So I put my hand up and I said to the guy sitting next to me, it's rubbish, isn't it? Because I'd signed up for Twitter about a year <laughs> before and not really understood what to do with it. So I just hadn't done anything. Uh, and he said, no, it's not rubbish. I think it's ironic that it's coming from a woman who had the most retweeted tweet in the world at some point, right? Yes. <laughs> <Because> eventually. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so you thought really that crazy. Twitter was rubbish. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think I didn't know what to do with right. it. And it wasn't until I saw people using it and what they were doing, it suddenly opened my eyes and I thought, mm -hmm. oh my God, I can, I can use this uh, as part of the campaign. So yeah, so from kind of chatting to the guy next to me, tweeting the guy on stage, uh, other friends in the audience who were on Twitter, and then following various people. And then sort of that day, really, at the end of 2008, I think, seeing that I could, at, at this conference, I could now see what those people that I'd been sitting next to were doing even if they weren't with me um you know like because so at a conference you could have friends in or people you follow in different sessions in a conference and you could see what's happening right so you can judge whether you're in the best room the best talk for you and kind of you know you can extrapolate that out so you can see what's happening around the world from individuals who are on the ground where it's happening so so that day was a sort of major um it's like a major light bulb moment for me i suppose in realizing oh my goodness i can use this for the bletchley park campaign so and i i realized things quite quickly like if i just type bletchley park into the search box in twitter i could find everyone in the world that was already talking about bletchley park and i could start a conversation with them and they could reply to me and we could you know it, it was just amazing how would i ever have been able to do that before i wouldn't you know it was a whole new paradigm it seemed for me um in finding people that are interested in the same thing that I am and then trying to kind of leverage that to make things happen. So I kind of spent probably around Christmas 2008, I think, getting used to Twitter. And then um, people started getting in touch with me. Oh, I'd set up a blog, Saving Bletchley Park blog, and um, put that on my profile on Twitter. And so people were finding me. So some people that were really great at social media, had a lot more experience than me, started getting in touch saying they wanted to help with the campaign. Um, also, I was finding people from just searching Bletchley Park and, and starting conversations with people around the world about Bletchley Park. And kind of just after Christmas, the, the um, guys that got in touch with me through Twitter saying they wanted to help. So I took them along to uh, talk by one of the code breakers that had become a family friend by then. Captain Jerry Roberts had got in touch by phone after the letter in the Times said that, that you know, he wanted to support the campaign. So he was giving a talk at UCL. So, so I uh, invited the social media uh, people that I'd met through Twitter along to Jerry's talk. And so, you know, they were blown away about how amazing he was because he absolutely was. I think he was about 90 by then, um, but just very eloquent. And um, one of the um, – Jemima who came along with us said that he was like an old – sort of not an old uh, film star. That's kind of what he was like, you know, and um, an incredible guy. And so I came along to that. Then when we came – we went up to Bletchley Park the next day. They saw the whole site at Bletchley Park got a tour. And um, kind of things really started from then, I think, because they were so good at social media. So I saw new ways of doing things. They helped with the campaign. It just kind of got bigger and bigger and bigger from people – who got excited about Bletchley Park, talking to other people. I was always saying, you know, to everybody, you know, it saved 22 million lives, blah, 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 you know, needs your support. And, and just kind of keeping that going. And then in February um, 2009, I think I saw um, Stephen Fry. Um, so I don't know if everyone knows who Stephen Fry is, but like one of the major sort of UK celebrities who's kind of known, he's a comedian and an actor, but he's also known for loving history and loving technology. So I saw, he tweeted a selfie of himself stuck in a lift in London and 
I just saw that and I just thought, Stephen Fry, he must be interested in Bletchley Park. So luckily he was following me on Twitter. So I was able to send him several direct messages asking him to get involved in the campaign. And, and the next morning he tweeted a link to my blog about the Bletchley Park campaign um, saying, you know, basically you need to, to, to support this campaign. And um, yeah, and so that day I became the most retweeted person in the world on, oh my on Twitter. That's crazy. It's just completely, yeah, <laughs> completely crazy um, in 2008. So of course, you know, that's never going to happen again. We see people with millions <laughs> of followers now. No, no yeah. one had a million followers then at all. You know, it was all mm. sort of hundreds of thousands was I think the highest. So that was incredible. And, and, and kind of, you know, I was learning as I went along really because I didn't know what I was doing with any of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but just kind of by following my nose, following my intuition, talking to people and and I think because I was so kind of desperate to save it you know I just Mm -hmm. was was trying any avenue of anything that would work yeah Um, and that paid off I guess in the end absolutely and I think you know if we were trying if we were to try to um sort of uh, extract the the your strategy there or what happened I think one of the really yeah. important points was that you felt so passionate about the cause right so that yeah. is definitely yeah. contagious when someone as you say because you were so desperate to say that I think that yeah. definitely came across and of course then yeah. you were able to connect with people who felt the same about the same yeah. cause and it sort of spread it became almost viral yeah yeah okay I, I guess that's it yeah and and I think that in organizations, because uh, a lot of our listeners listen to the podcast because they want to create change within their companies, they see something that they don't like. They um, wonder whether they have the power to change it. Um, yeah. So what would you what would you say to someone who's in that position in their company, seeing either an injustice or a toxic environment or mm. something that is happening and shouldn't be happening? Um, what do you what do you have to say to them? I think it depends what your position is in the company to start with. So I think, you know, like the lower down you are in a company, the less power you have to change things. I think it's kind of like my life experience now. So, you know, I always think you can change anything, um, but kind of from what's happened to, to me in my kind of career and, and other people that I've talked to, you know, I've mentored probably hundreds of people over the years, if not more than that. Um, and, you know, I, it, it depends. It's like you can't give advice which works in every situation, you yeah. know, like every mm. company. Um, but I think, I guess my strategy, so, so when I've had difficult situations at work and I've um, – not been you know I've I've not been so it's been in, within universities basically where I've worked as organizations mainly and um, I think either me or other people if you're lower down in the organization the lower down you are the harder it is I think basically mm-hmm. um, but that doesn't mean that you you can't change things and and my strategy would always be to you know work out what it is that needs to change and then work out a solution to that. So, you know, if you've got a problem with something, I think it's not usually, I think people like solutions. So if you've got a problem, you work out yourself possible solutions to that problem. And then when you go to talk to people about the problem, you tell them the solutions as well. Mm -hmm. So that, because I think a lot of the time, if you present people who a lot of the time are already busy with a problem, they might feel like something needs to change, but if there's no solution, they're not going to come up with it. So I think yeah. having some sort of solution in mind, even when you're first talking about a problem, is is the mm-hmm. best thing, is the mm-hmm. best approach to yeah. take. Um, and then from there, so speak to the most natural person to speak about it with. So, for example, if, if there's someone at your level that's causing you problems, talk to them about it. You know, I mean, it's in our culture that's like that's not what you want to do <laughs> you know I, like most we people don't want I think, to be hate conflict yeah. Yeah. no no we hate conflict we hate like all of those you know that those are difficult conversations but I think unfortunately that's the best way forward is to just go and talk about it and you might not get the response you want but at least you've tried I think um, I think you have mm-hmm. to start with the person or the situation that's causing you the problem and cr- try and solve it at source um and and basically then my approach after that is if that doesn't work then 
go higher up. And if that doesn't work, then go higher up. And if that doesn't, I mean, basically just kind of go higher up and higher up till you get to the top. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you still can't get support for making the change that needs to happen for you to be yourself, to be comfortable in that environment, then it's not the right environment for you. So, yeah. so I think that's really generic. I don't know if that can apply to every situation, but in my experience, that's what I have done. Uh, and that's what in general I advise other people to do. Yeah, I think I think definitely that applies to a lot of situations and particularly that bit about trying to figure it out ourselves first, not just complaining or pointing yeah. to a problem, but yeah. thinking, you know, how would I solve that? What would be a practical solution to this? And then, as you say, addressing the problem with someone, but also having a suggested solution. And it doesn't mean that you have to necessarily um, do it all on your own in terms of finding a solution, but it's good to get the conversation started with a solution focus rather than a problem focus. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. completely. Yeah, and, mm. and allies are great. So, yeah, I didn't mention that. Yeah. But, of course, you know, within an organization, find find your allies. And, you know, if, if you're 100% sure that the people that you're talking to about issues that you've got are are okay to talk to Um, because sometimes in a toxic environment you don't quite know who's your ally and who isn't so it can be really difficult I think but if you there definitely are people that you know you can trust then then talk to them uh, and kind of Mm -hmm. get their feedback on your ideas but I I really think that trusting your gut instincts you you will know what to do for your situation you know if you really sort of look deep inside yourself um you'll you'll know what what the best thing to do is um and but having allies is great so if that if you do have any allies then then of course um use them but but if you don't then you know you can do it on your own yes yeah completely okay fantastic so um i think it's time for the quick fire questions well, oh. I, I'll ask you five questions in rapid succession and we'll yeah. aim at answering all these questions in under two minutes. Okay. okay. Well. <laughs> all right, let's go. So yeah. h- how do you define organizational culture? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Start with an easy <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I guess it's the way people relate to each other within an organization. And what is a sign that a company culture needs some work or even a major overhaul? Um, the business is not doing well and people are not happy. Are there any companies that you admire for the culture? And if yes, why? No, I can't think of one that, that I know of that, <laughs> that has the perfect culture. I think we're still working on that. We haven't sorted that out yet because until we have equality, that can't exist. And what about books? Books on culture, leadership or any other books that you believe our listeners would benefit from reading? Well, I tend to read uh, books that either make me laugh or, um, you know, kind of like give me information about how Mm -hmm. to, I guess, run my life better. Um, And I can can never remember any titles of anything. (laughs) Um, But there was a really good one about, uh, oh my goodness, I can't remember the title of it. We can come uh, back to that later when you remember. I'll have to come back to you. I'll send you. I'll send you it. <laughs> okay. And we'll post it in the show notes, guys. So don't worry. Thank You'll you. get uh, Sue's book, Hopefully. definitely. <laughs> um, so so um, now, what is one thing that our listeners can do tomorrow? So, you know, really small practical thing. Yeah. Build their own culture lab and start cultivating a culture within their team or within their organization that will help them to bring their vision to life, whatever that vision is. I think, well, look, I'm kind of going into my experience. What I did when I was running a department of 17 people, when I arrived, I spent an hour talking to each person about what they cared about and what they wanted from their job, strengths and weaknesses of themselves and the organization. And and then found it actually after that quite easy to, to talk to everybody about what we wanted to do and get them all on track. And I think it's because I knew them all and then they all knew me from doing that. So I think get to know the people you're working with really well. It seems pretty straightforward, but of course we, we both know and a lot of our listeners know that actually many managers don't do that or don't do it often enough. Um, no. sort of keep, keep those relationships going um, and, and make a lot of assumptions about their people but people evolve and change so if you haven't talked to your team members for 
a while, yeah. then perhaps it's a good, yeah. <laughs> good opportunity to reconnect with them and see yeah, what they care about today. Because well, people yeah. will behave differently in groups. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So who would you recommend, Sue, as a next guest on the podcast? We're looking for people who have been successful in either consciously and intentionally shaping cultures like you are doing or, or people who think or write um, interesting things about leadership, culture or personal growth. Um, I think, do you know, have you interviewed Dame Stephanie Shirley? No. She's amazing. Okay. She, she's um, a UK philanthropist now, uh, but she came over to the UK during the Second World War as a six-year-old as part of the kinder transports and ended up setting up one of the, I think, world's first software houses Uh, where she employed nearly all women uh, and uh, they, for example, wrote the um, software for the Concorde black box flight recorder. Mm. Um, she's an amazing woman and has had an amazing career. Yeah. And uh, yes, yeah, so she she only had to start employing men in 1975 when the Sex Discrimination Act came into force. Wow. And she, she had to employ men. Before that, she was mainly employing women programming from home. So yeah, she's an could incredible you, person. Could you put me in touch with her? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. I'd love to speak to her. <laughs> Wonderful. She's incredible. Yeah. Thank you so much. So um, in closing, Sue, are there any, you know, closing remarks that or final words of wisdom that you'd like to leave our listeners with? Well, I just think in general, trust your gut instincts, surround yourself with people that support you um, and go for it love that go for it <laughs> i think that that, that that has been the story of your life and to a great extent actually of my life as well yeah. so i can't agree more with a strategy just go for it and you know yeah. if it doesn't work out try something else and experiment yes yeah, absolutely <laughs> we're, we're so we're brought up to be so scared of failure and that that's just bad for uh, yeah us. yeah so true well thank you very very much for this conversation it was wonderful speaking to you very inspirational and i'm sure that our listeners will love this episode thank you wonderful thank you no i've enjoyed it thanks very much Talking to Sue reminded me that the more scared we are of doing something, the more important it is that we actually do it. I think it was Stephen Pressfield who said something along these lines. Fear is good. Like self-doubt, fear is an indicator. It tells us what we have to do. And the more scared we are of work or calling, the more sure we can be that we have to do it. So thank you, Sue Black, for being our guest. And thank you for listening. Thank you to our sound producer, James Ead from Be Heard, our production manager, Lindsay Nunes, content contributor and editor, Rachel Nice, and art director, Emily Spencer. If you enjoyed this episode, we would be so grateful if you could take a minute and leave a review on iTunes or anywhere else. And also, please share it with your friends using the hashtag Handle on Culture. By doing this, you're helping others discover the Culture Lab, and it's really the best thing you can do to reward us for our work and commitment to bring you a new episode every two weeks. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the Culture Lab Insider. It's very easy. You just type agabayer.com slash podcast into your browser and scroll down to the bottom of the page where you will find the sign up form. And now a preview of our next episode with a guest that doesn't really need an introduction for most of you, the president and CEO of WD40, Gary Rich. Our job is to make sure we create an environment where our tribe members wake up each day inspired to go to work, feel safe while they are there and return home at the end of the day fulfilled by the work they do, feeling they have learned something new and contributed to something bigger than themselves. That's the definition of our purpose, which is people in life today in the world are looking for purpose. People are talking about building a coaching culture, a program that helps organizations embed coaching in their DNA. The two-day session for creating and building a coaching culture in the organization, the strategies we have learned is amazing. An excellent session. It gave us a lot of um, examples 
uh, especially practical examples, and some of them I am definitely going to um, implement in my company. It is a good starting point uh, for creating a coaching culture in our organization. And um, it really had good examples that we can take on um, into our company. Aga is very knowledgeable. She has the talent of passing this knowledge over to us. Truly, this is a session I fully recommend. Very, very good coach. <laughs> I have, you know, other people to compare and I think she's a very good very, very, very good, excellent coach. The seminar was very insightful, empowering and inspirational. Aga is a great uh, tutor and uh, a, an amazing coach. So it's um, the items that I got from uh, this seminar, I can implement them also personally and professionally. Thank you for listening to this episode of Culture Lamp. If you found any moments that were interesting, inspiring, or maybe even game-changing, please share it with someone who'd appreciate it. After all, good ideas are meant to be shared. <laughs>